things like in your life now? Do you even take God. them? Not really. I mean, I just had a meeting. All my team is spread out all everywhere. They're in Canada. They're in Texas. They're in California. They're in New York, New Jersey, all over. And uh, I just had a Zoom meeting with all the producers saying, we should chat. You know, like after the Kelly file, I'd meet with my whole team every night and we'd chat. Like this worked. This didn't work. What did you think? Bah, bah, bah. We never get to do that now because we're all spread out. And it was great. It was so delightful. And I could see them better. We could do, I, I miss you know, people. I miss actually seeing my my team, my staff. And then they 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 miss the benefit of my wisdom, Mike, when they don't get those. <laughs> my wisdom is well, something like this. Why the fuck did we do it that way? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know this from working on a daily show for most of your life, I'm sure, but I had a boss at, at CBS years ago and I was doing this thing called Evening Magazine every night. You know, and I'd agonize over trying to get this half hour as good as it could be. And sometimes it came right down to the wire, you know, like that broadcast news moment where people are running through the hallways Bobby, with the Bobby, tape Bobby, and the Bobby. tape. Yes, yes, yes. And I remember saying to Mike, you know, he would call me at my desk and he'd tell me about the piece and I'd say, is it good? And he'd say, Mike, it's better than good. It's huh? done. <laughs> and I was like, it took me a while to get yeah. my head around it. But when you do a daily show, right? I mean, what do you? what's the point in beating yourself over yesterday's disaster? You got one coming up tomorrow. <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's funny you say it because that's exactly what I said to my team. I said, look, and this is true. I said, I, I'm never going to get mad at you for actually screwing up the news because news is a difficult business and you can definitely misstep. People lay traps, you know, ideally over time you figure mm -hmm. out where they are, where they, where's the quicksand. Um, but I'm never going to get mad because you made an honest mistake in actually preparing the packet or getting ready for the segment. What I will get mad at is not owning it. Like, I want you to be coming to yeah. me before I go to you to say, this is where I screwed up. This is what I'm going to do to make sure it never happens again. That's all, you know, and, and they got it. Like I, that's, and I, I want that in anybody who works for me. I, I like the person who Brit Hume used, used to say, winners take responsibility, losers blame others. That is so true. <clears throat> and it's so simple. Is, is a mad Megan different today in this situation you're in than say a Mad Megan was, you know, in the Fox or the NBC days? Because you really, you know, I, just so people understand, I don't know of anybody who's come from the traditional world of broadcasting into the space that you're occupying right now. I know lots of people in your space, but I don't know of anyone who took the, the route that you took. So a lot of what I wanted to talk to you about today was just life inside this I think very unusual uh, rubric that you've mm -hmm. you've fashioned for yourself. But my question was, you know, are you crankier now than you used to be? <laughs> no, I'm happier now. I'm I'm happier. I'm less cranky. You know, look, I'm fiery. I'm mm. half Italian, half Irish. So everybody knows what that means, right? It's like you're mm -hmm. ready yeah. to fight at all times. Um, so, but <laughs> but truly, the only thing that will ever really get me actually angry with the team is not taking responsibility for screw ups. It's not that you can't have a scrub. It's that you didn't own it. Um, if I need to explain to you why you screwed it up, I'm going to get progressively angry as, you know, if I have to keep rounding back to you five more times so that you get it because as the anchor, as the host, well, all I'm hearing is it's going to happen to me again. She's going to do it again. Mm -hmm. She doesn't get it. So it's mm -hmm. going to happen over and over. I'm going to be embarrassed publicly. But back when I was doing like cable news live and not really the afternoon show as much, but really the, the primetime show, um, I was what much more stressed out and I was under attack all the time. So you're like, you know, you're ready. You're like, okay, you know, I'm looted for bear too. And, and you're, you know, you understand your team's there to protect you, but you also feel like if they screw up, you're the one who's going to have the egg on their face and it's going to become a national news story. And you're going to have 10 articles written about it and you could get fired. You know, now it's like, I'm not going to get fired. I own the company. No one's firing me. I'm good. <laughs> and I also just don't feel like every word I say is under such scrutiny anymore. So I just feel more relaxed. It's, it's not as high pressure as it used to be. But it's interesting because, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? So you trade in one batch of stuff and nonsense for a different kind of weight. Because now, you know, you're your decisions, you know, have consequences that impact lots of other people, I would think. But that's really what yeah. I want to get at. I mean, what, 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 
I, I'm doing this thing, and I think I might have said this to you before, because it's, I've spent 25 years either with a, a boss on the production side or a network suit or somebody somewhere who I really need to consider before I open my big mouth. Now, it's just some advertisers, some of whom come and go, others who are loyal, but mostly it's the listener, you know? So to have a straight line to them, it, it's so, I, I think it's hard for people to understand what a, what a privilege that is, but man, you have it now, like it's, few people do. It's so much more valuable to me as just a person to feel that connection. So people used to watch me on Fox. Yes, I had some genuine fans who would tune in just for my show. But I would say most people watch because I was on after O'Reilly. It's like you have Fox News on, like there's O'Reilly and there's Kelly and she's not gonna disappoint me. It's not like she's gonna upset me. So yeah, and you never know. Is it me or is it the platform that's resulting hmm. in my success here? You know, And believe me, Roger Ailes did his level best to tell us all it was the platform. You know, it sure. was not us. Um, and, you know, as any sort of talent, love how that's how we refer to ourselves in the industry. We'll, and we will call ourselves the talent. Um, but any talent gets in one's head like, uh, you know, do I have a career if it doesn't work out with this particular employer? So I come over here. And that was actually one of the reasons why I didn't launch on YouTube for a year. I just went audio only for the first year because I thought there was going to be such value to just being heard. That's it. Just being heard. Yeah. Like, will they come? If there's no false eyelashes, if there's no, you know, fox <laughs> blonde mm -hmm. arama, you know, there's no like off the shoulder. If there's not none of that, it's just me talking. And they did come. And then after a year, I was like, all right, let's, you know, go both barrels. And we did YouTube and that grew exponentially over the couple the year we've been doing it. So all of that's real. That those guys are there for me and my team and the way we deliver the news. And I see it now, Mike, even we started this weekly. It's not really a newsletter, but on Fridays we send out this sort of newsletter where we just up, it's like one minute or less to learn all the days, all the week's news. And we do some show highlights. And my, the woman who runs it for us is like, the open rates are exponential. Virtually every single person who gets this email opens it. And she's like, you know, you don't see this. And the reason is because those people and I have an actual relationship. It's, they're not just watching me because I'm on After O'Reilly. They know yeah. me. I feel like I'm getting to know them. It's a real thing. And it's just really rewarding. Which is why it's a very different thing to ask, will they come as opposed to will they stay? Why do they stay? Why do they come back? And, and, and what things get in between or in the way of that relationship, whether it's NBC or Fox or any of the traditional stuff, it seems to have changed every single thing, this shifting platform to the point where you can now tweet out a thing on M&Ms and wind up engaged in a really robust conversation that on the one hand is patently absurd, yes. but on the other hand is actually intensely important to lots and lots of people. And you get to decide yeah. how, much, how much gray matter to devote to that particular hot mess. It's so empowering, right? It's like you don't, you no, know, I, don't, I no longer need Fox News or NBC, but kind of nobody needs Fox News or NBC now. Like anybody can get the, in front of a microphone or in front of their phone for TikTok and go viral for their opinion if it's interesting enough. Like there is a, there is a bar, there's some quality control built in and sort of the natural instincts of consumers. And that's amazing. If I were at Fox, I'd be in a panic right now because I'd be seeing all the cord snippers and I'd be seeing all these interesting people rising up in the industry that has the upward mobility. And I'd be thinking we have a shorter lifespan over here. Um, but yeah, no, I love that. And I do feel like really lucky that we have this opportunity, this audience that I think the reason they come back to us is they, they know they're gonna get, I hate the words overused, but authenticity. And honestly, they're gonna get truth. Like uh, there's a higher bar on my program when it comes to the news. We don't just read and rip Twitter. Like yeah. we have a staff, we have a real budget for producing. That's where most of our budget goes so that we check our facts. And if we screw up our facts, unlike a lot of, you know, sort of people who are just randomly doing news analysis, we'll come back on the next day and tell you. Yeah. Well, look, it, let me show you my notes, like just by way of comparison. This, 
This is what I've put together for our <laughs> chat today, all right? This is the extent of my prep. Now, this drives Chuck crazy. And this I didn't even write until you said the word bathroom when you were talking about Google. I just wrote potty talk. And the reason you and I, I wrote do it, it all the time. This is our thing, yes. Mike. This is what we, what we do. We are reasonably successful in our chosen fields. And we've each worked for a lot of really, really big platforms. But the last time you and I spoke, we took a very weird and very <laughs> deep dive into a really tragic bathroom <laughs> on tragic. a 737, right? That was amazing. And, and I, I told you about that ridiculous story. And I, it was the great, I thought about it a million times. So, how did, can that happen on NBC? Can that happen on Fox? No. Can that happen in any traditional paradigm? It's not, I'm not proud of the fact that it devolved into an unapologetic scatological romp. <laughs> I'm proud of the fact that I heard from thousands of people yeah. who watched that exchange and just came to me and said, Mike, first of all, I love Megan. And I've never heard her really talk like that to anybody before. And I've never really heard you talk to anybody of her stature like that before. <laughs> and it made us all feel so damn human. It yeah. made us just feel like, right, everybody's got this sphincter and they're all counting on it. <laughs> and, and, and to your point before, forgive me, this is probably a stretch, but the thing that pisses you off is when people don't take responsibility for their actions on your team in the yeah. course of their job. And underneath that whole ridiculous conversation we had, that was my beef. That whoever went into that bathroom and destroyed it before I wandered in didn't take responsibility. They didn't raise their hand and say, that was me, right? That's, and that's so I got the blame for it. You're asking this. too much. Who, who would walk out of the airplane bathroom and say, I did it, I did it, I dropped a bomb, left a stinker but, right here. Yeah. But on, it just seems like on a plane, what are your options? You just sit there and look out the window. I've already saw you, came out. Nope, wasn't me. Nothing to see here. No. I don't know. No. I just I just think the fact that we ha that we could have that conversation is empowering. The fact that we did is crazy. And yeah, the fact no, that the feedback as a result of it was so great is instructive. It's awesome. And it's like, no one's expecting it. I did have a, a notebook that looked like this for you that my team had put together. We could have discussed so many interesting news stories or stuff that you're doing, projects, all this. No, we devoted maybe 40 minutes to toilet problems, bathroom habits, embarrassing moments in that department. And everybody loved it. We got so many clicks and downloads from that. And just because, you know what, some days you, you need a laugh. You just need to hear, like, you just need to hear a light, conversation about something that's kind of amusing, kind of funny, makes you think a little between two people who ideally you like and just spend some time sort of with friends, you know, and not exactly mm -hmm. friends, but sort of friends. Like it just makes you feel it can't all be red meat, kill Biden. You know, it's got to <laughs> yeah. be a little bit of everything. It's exhausting. And and, you know, to be a fly on the wall, if it's an interesting wall, right, that's that's what I think this offers people. It's a chance to be a little bit more engaged than they normally would. But not to suck up, but the thing I love about you and I've and I've seen I've seen you make this call on the air a thousand times. I've seen you and forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think you you generally know what the next question you're going to ask is going to be if things follow if things go the way you think they're going to go. But the minute you hear something you didn't think you were going to hear, it all goes out the window. Mm. And you'll take your cue from that. And and that's what I meant before. Producers don't like that. You know, it, the, oh. they, it just makes them very, very, very nervous. Oh, can I say, um, at, at NBC, but, everything. Like, they wanted to script everything. Fox News cable's a little yeah. bit more freewheeling, but at NBC, they were like, and here are your questions that you will ask. And I was like, what, what do you mean? I don't, I don't need your questions. That's literally my job. It's the only thing I, they, I get paid to do. They're like, oh, no, no, no. These are the questions that have been pre-approved by legal and st standards and legal. I'm like, I'm not asking your question. And then if you would deviate, they'd be like, oh, I, I have these non-lawyers writing yes. legal questions for me on Supreme Court cases that we're talking about. I'm like, did this person practice law? Because I did. I don't need to. like... It was so confining. I would never go back there. I, I would never go back to cable either. But I really not go back to broadcast where they really box you up. 
And you're right. Listening is half the battle. Listening is a skill as an interviewer. And if you have confidence, you can do it. Like when you're a newbie, it's harder, right? Because you're like, I, but I have my list and I'm just not going to deviate from my <laughs> list. And uh, But I think the, the best interviewers are good listeners and just are curious people. It's like the, uh, the guy in office space with the stapler. No, but this was, it's, this it's, is my stapler. It's my stapler. <laughs> it's my right. stapler. And it's my That's question. Good. And I, it's and I, need to, <laughs> I need to get my question out. It's, 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 it's all been ordained. Just so this doesn't sound like two people, you know, bitching about their industry. What, what do viewers and listeners really need to understand when they're watching the news on Pick Your Poison, Fox, CNN, NBC, whatever. What do they need to know that, in your estimation, most of them don't? How to watch critically, in other words. Mm, I mean, they know by now, I think, that every news program and anchor has an agenda, and that has to be heavily factored in. Um, I, maybe they don't know how desperate they are to scare you. That's a big part of the business you know, yeah. to scare you and definitely to outrage you. I think people do know that they're trying to outrage you, but they love it if they can scare the bejesus out of you. And that's, yeah. that's not a good motive, but there's a reason a lot of people who watch cable all day long are walking around feeling kind of unhappy. You know, you, mm. it's not a good idea to put on Fox News and leave it on all day. And Fox is my favorite of the news can channels, but it's certainly not a good idea to do that with MSNBC or CNN. But no. They have an agenda that's not consistent with well-being. You know, that's something that like, even like a martini, you know, you should just have the one. Don't, <laughs> you, you can't have one every hour from 8 a.m. forward. It's not yeah. going to end well. Well, you can. I've, <laughs> I've experimented. And you're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're right. Doesn't end well. 